Okay, come, let us pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, as we gather together, as your people in this, your house of prayer, we pray that you will help us once again to acknowledge fully your complete sovereignty over all our lives and over all our affairs. And as we come to attend to your word, help us, Lord, to see the commitment, the obedience, and the surrender that you won from us. So help us, Lord, for I pray all this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> You know, today, today we gathered to uh, mark the 23rd anniversary of uh, Moriah's uh, uh, English congregation anniversary. It is a much delayed celebration. You know, the pandemic can delay us, but it cannot. Thank God, it cannot rob us of our joy in the Lord. So on behalf of the church, I would first like to thank Deacon Ben Wong and the Young Adult Fellowship uh, for organizing this service and all the fundraising uh, activities associated with our 23rd anniversary. So thank you. I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to urge all members and friends <clears throat> to be earnest about our building fund. We have a big mountain to climb, to journey towards the renewal of the land lease of Moriah. It's been more than 23 years since a few of us started the journey from Sumbawang to Simei build this church by God's grace and name it Moriah for a reason. You know, 23 years roughly is one generation. And that means we have less than five years to the end of Moriah's 30-year land lease. And the journey forward, the journey forward now will have to be led by this generation and by the people here now. So this journey is hard. You would require commitment, trust, obedience, and surrender to God for this journey. So today I'd like to explore these themes with you in a hope that if you are already on this journey, you will stay resolutely on it. And for those who are not yet on this journey, you will, I pray that you will come onto this path uh, to true blessings. I'll do this by looking in at the story in Genesis chapter 22, where God commanded very strangely, God commanded Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. So please turn with me uh, to your Bibles, to Genesis 22. <clears throat> and I'll read for you the first 18 verses of this uh, chapter. Please follow along as I read it to you. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Please take note of that. Take your son, go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. 
So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Verse 4, On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hands the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. Verse 7, And Isaac said to his father, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. <clears throat> so they both went together. When they came to the place of which God told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand, took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he says, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. In Hebrew, that is Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, that is Moriah, it will be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sown, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offsprings as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of God, and may he bless us as we uh, attend to it. You know, <clears throat> this is a very hotly debated story. It is debated among the Jews, the Christians, biblical scholars, and the Muslims. But if you read this story as literature, you are confronted with many, many questions. For example, is it a story of an abusing, abusive God? I think somebody is at the door trying to get in, I think. Maybe this, the newcomers? Okay. <clears throat> so, if you read this as literature, you are confronted with many questions. I'm sure as you listen to the text, you will have a lot of 
questions. Why is this strange uh, story recorded in the Bible? Is it a story of a very abusive God uh, who is no different from the Canaanite idol gods that demanded child sacrifices in the land of Cana at that time? Or is it a story of a misguided Abraham? Or is it just religious violence at its worst? Now, before we get into this story, to learn the principles and lessons needed for our journey ahead, let me reacquaint you with a famous verse, maybe the most famous verse in the New Testament, John 3.16. Everybody knows this, but just let me read it to you. John 3.16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You know, believers readily accept this promise that whosoever believes in him, that is, belief in Jesus Christ, should not perish, but have eternal life. We readily believe this. And that is good. But when we share this and nothing more with pre-believers, we may actually create an impression of easy Christianity. Just believe and you will have eternal life. Wow, so easier. So friends, if you do that, if you share that, and do nothing more. We may not actually be doing ourselves and our friends a favor. If it were that easy, nobody will go to hell. If it is that easy, nobody will be heading towards hell. If we just believe and do nothing else and start to feel comfortable secured and assured and go on our lives happily thinking that nothing more is required of us, we may be falling into, devil, into the devil's schemes. Why? Because this verse, this verse tells only one half of the story. The other half is found elsewhere in the Bible. For example, let me just quote one example in the interest of time. In the book of Acts chapter 3 verse 19, it says, Repent, repent and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. Your sins is what will take you to hell if it is not blotted out. So, therefore, repent and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out. So to believe and to turn back. You know, when I put these two things together, I come to the conclusion that the Christian life entails a lifelong journey, a lifelong journey of wholehearted commitment, faith, obedience, and surrender. Now, that may sound scary, but there are many, many blessings along the way and at the end of the journey. So now, let's get back to the story. The story in Genesis uh, chapter 22. The story begins at chapter 22, verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham. After these things, God tested Abraham. Now, what do the words after these things mean? These things cover about 35 years. 35 years, maybe more, of Abraham's experience and walk with God. It started when he was called to leave his country, his people, 
to go to a land that he doesn't know anything about, to go to the land that God will show him. Abraham obeyed. And in a journey, God promised to make him the father of a great nation. Now, if you're going to be a father, you have to get a wife and have children, right? But his wife, Sarah, was unable to conceive. So in desperation, Sarah suggested to Abraham to have children through her servant, Hagar, which was culturally accepted, acceptable at that time. Children born in their household become their children. So though the text does not say it, but it was obvious that Abraham and Sarah were trying to help God fulfill his promise. How vain can man get? They were trying to help God fulfill his promise that he made to them on oath. And through this man-made act, Sarah's Egyptian, Egyptian maid gave birth to Ishmael. After that, Abraham and Sarah had to wait another 14 years, well beyond their childbearing ages, before God miraculously gave them another son from their own bodies, whom they named Isaac. This is the son of promise. By the way, I, Isaac is Yishak in uh, Hebrew. It means they, he laughs. Because when God made this promise to them, when Abraham was 100 years old and Sarah was 80-something years old, or, or thereabouts, and then they say, God said to him, them, you will have a child. What do you think their reaction was? They laugh. So, so it's natural. After this, <laughs> they name uh, uh, Isaac as uh, Yishak. He laughs. And after Isaac was born, Sarah insisted that Abraham cast out Ishmael and his mother, Hagar. With great sorrow, Abraham complied. That is all after these things. Maybe 30, 35, 37 years of experience that Abraham had with God. And then now, God demands what appears to be a most horrible thing. Genesis chapter 22, verse 2. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. You know, the Hebrew text of this story is really beautiful and succinct. Abraham did not argue, did not protest. He just set out with Isaac. Isaac to do what God demanded. Abraham doesn't say much. Isaac says even less. And we are left to imagine what they are thinking and feeling. Remember, if Isaac is killed for the sacrifice, the promise of blessings of a great nation will die with him. End of story, full stop. Now put yourselves in Abraham's shoes. How would you feel? How would you react? I can't imagine. Will your faith be strong enough for you to obey? Will your commitment to God be deep enough for you to surrender to his command. You know, the narrator uh, of this story uses language to heighten the poignancy of the, of the story. 
Genesis 22, 6 and 7 says, And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hands the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where, where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? What do you think went through Abraham's heart? What do you think went through Abraham's heart? Father and son walked together in silence for three days. This is a beautiful picture of father and son being together in purpose, together in love, together to obey God. So up to this point, what is the lesson for us? Up to this point in the story, what is the lesson? You know, no matter how we view this story, I believe the first primary uh, reason, uh, the primary lesson is this. And there, of course, there are many, many lessons. <clears throat> and the primary reason, uh, purpose for me, the lesson for me is this. Where God took Abraham, <clears throat> where God took Abraham is where he seeks to bring each one of us. That is, God desires to bring each one of us to the very point of ultimate surrender to him. That is the point he brought Abraham to. And that is where he wants to bring us to, the point of ultimate surrender to him. That is because God will bless <coughs> God will bless the one who obediently surrenders everything to him. This is such a big emotional story. Let me clear my throat first. <coughs> so, <coughs> so where God took Abraham is where he wants to bring each one of us to the point of ultimate surrender to him. Because God will bless you when you obediently surrender everything to him. For example, the Bible says this in many, many places. Just let me pick one example. Jeremiah 17, 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. So, <clears throat> take your son. God tells Abraham, Offer him as a burnt offering. A burnt offering is one that is completely offered to God. You get no part of it back, unlike the other sacrifices. Burnt offering is completely given to God. <clears throat> now, I want to point out something very, very significant here. <clears throat> From the day God called Abraham, to leave his hometown and family. It was a long process. I mentioned more than 30, maybe 40 years. It was a long process of God stripping, taking away, stripping from him all that he clung to until finally he had only God alone to hold on to. God's first command was for him to leave his country, his relatives, and his father's house. In other words, his comfort zone. Everything that makes him comfortable and secure. God stripped it away. Over the years, God stripped Abraham of his man-made schemes and efforts to help bring about God's promise. This reached a climax when Abraham painfully had to send Hagar and Ishmael away. 
Now, after Isaac was born, Abraham must have rejoiced as young Isaac, the son of promise, grew to manhood. The old man may have often looked fondly at the boy and uh, give th given thanks to God. But what a shock when suddenly one day God says, offer him as a burnt offering. We know, we know that Abraham obeyed. He built the altar, he cut the wood, he built the altar, he lit the fire on Mount Moriah, he bound Isaac, who by the way didn't protest. He raised the knife to kill his son for the sacrifice. Abraham shows he is completely surrendered to God's will. Complete surrender. That is the way for much blessings to flow for him and all his future ch children. The point is this. When we come to Christ, when we come to Jesus Christ and trust him, we ourselves begin a lifelong journey to surrender to him. Some of you may know the story of Jim uh, Elliot, a young American missionary who went to Ecuador and was martyred there when he was just 28 years old. In his book, Shadow of the Almighty, he wrote, one does not surrender a life in an instant. That which is lifelong can only be surrendered in a lifetime. So it is a long process. Long, long process. The Christian life is a process of yielding all of ourselves to God. One little bit at a time. It will be difficult. There will be many struggles and burdens uh, to overcome, to fight, but fight and overcome we must. Abraham obeyed and surrendered to God's will, right up to the point of offering Isaac as a sacrifice. But just as he was about to do so, he heard a voice from heaven. Do not lay your hand on this, the boy, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. As if God doesn't know this. God already knows this. But God is testing Abraham's faith. And Abraham doesn't know that he's being tested. So he has to show that he is totally surrendered. So God says, now I know that you fear me. What is God doing here? What is God doing here? You know, by taking Abraham up to the very point of killing Isaac, the Lord allow him to enter into God's heart as closely as as any human being could to experience how God must have felt in giving his only son, Jesus Christ, to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He loves, so he gives. He gives because he loves. So what happens initially, what appears initially to be a strange command to Abraham in our story, actually reveals God's great love for us in sending his own son, his only son, to die for our sins. God was not asking Abraham to do anything that he himself would not do. And the second primary uh, lesson for us is this. Genesis chapter 22, verse 5. Then Abraham said to his young man, 
when they reached the land of Moriah, when they saw the mountain, then Abraham said to his young men, the two young men, servants that he brought with him, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. God, I mean, Abraham obeyed God without hesitation because he saw this as an act of worship. He saw it as an act of worship. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. There is the altar that he will build, the fire he will light for the burnt offering. So Abraham saw the sacrifice he was called to make as an act of worship. So therefore, beloved, the lesson for us is obedience. Obedience is the heart of worship. Obedience is the heart of worship. Abraham shows that his focus was not on the sacrifice. His focus was on his great God. So if we hesitate to obey the difficult commands of God, it may be that we have lost sight of God's greatness and lost sight of our duty to worship. You know, today, while God will not allow us to kill our children, in fact, there are many advisories against this. Not only stay apart, but you cannot murder your children. While God today will not ask us to kill our children, the story of Abraham teaches us that he, however, expects at least two main things from us. First, be totally submitted and surrender. That is the least he expects from us. And second, he expects us to cultivate a true heart of worship and obedience is a sign of a true heart of worship so abraham's journey to mount moriah the place of sacrifice took three days from the day he started from where he was to walk up to the place where mount moriah was it took three days and by the way it was a silent journey and he got up early the next day after god commanded him i wonder what was going through his heart what was going through his mind. But they traveled in silence. They traveled for three days to reach Mount Moriah. Our journey will be a lifelong process, a process of growing in faith, commitment, obedience, and surrender to God in order to let him mold us into the image of his son. And just and just as he provided for Abraham, you can be sure God will also provide for you what is necessary for your journey. Verses 12 to 13 of Genesis 25. When Abraham raised his knife to kill and sacrifice Isaac, he heard this voice from heaven, Do not lay your hand on the boy, or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. There's another sermon here. Very interesting. The words, why when he lifted up his eyes and looked behind him, there was a ram. It was a very significant. He must have walked past that place, but he didn't see the ram the first time. 
So now, after he is shown that he is totally surrendered to God, he turns around, God opens his eyes, and he sees the ram. God has provided. So he went, untied the ram, and offered uh, the ram uh, as a burnt offering instead of his son. So God provided for him. Like I said, there's another sermon here we'll, which we'll do another time. The Lord knew. The Lord knew the place he was leading Abraham to. On that spot where he would ask Abraham to take the life of his beloved son. God knew something else about that place. He knew that centuries later, Mount Moriah would become known as Mount Calvary. He knows that his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would die on a cross there to save humanity. And he foreshadowed this by providing the ram on Mount Moriah as a substitute for Isaac. Beloved, to satisfy the demands of his holiness and justice, God demands the death of the sinner. But that is precisely what he has provided for every sinner in the death of his son, who is our substitute. In John's Gospel, <clears throat> when the Pharisees confronted Jesus, Jesus tells them this, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and he was glad. I think he was referring to this incident. Abraham was able to look ahead and see how God would provide salvation in the person of his son. So, beloved, faith, commitment, obedience, and surrender. Where God took Abraham is where God wants to take us. And I hope and pray that we all will stay on that journey to reach that point. Come, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you We want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for showing this to us today. But as we look into this, we confess that we are nowhere near the point to which you want to take us. Because we are stubborn, we are proud, we are vain, we are disobedient, and uh, we are wayward. But we place all these sins before you and beg for humility. Humility to surrender all, to commit everything and to obey you, your will so that we can be led joyfully and blessfully to the point where you want us to go. Hear this, my prayer. And bless us with this message, for I pray and ask with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.